Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome. Uh, today is Tuesday, May 24th, 2022. We've got a really great program in store for everyone this evening. Uh, my name is Christopher Paget. I'm the president of the Kentucky Genealogical Society. It's a pleasure to be with you tonight. And uh, we've got a great speaker lined up for you this evening. Um, before we get started and I introduce tonight's speaker, just have a little bit of housekeeping, as you know. Uh, so, um, and I'm in Louisville, Kentucky. So, uh, if you're, uh, you're joining us from somewhere outside of Kentucky, maybe put that in the chat. We always like to hear where folks are from. Uh, we are a community. We're completely grassroots, run by and for researchers, led by an all-volunteer board. We have no paid employees, uh, no building. We're a 501c3 nonprofit. We've been around since 1973, uh, focused on all 120 of Kentucky's counties. Uh, annual membership is $20. We keep it really low so as many researchers as possible can access the community. Uh, we're really excited about our strategic collaboration with FamilySearch, which is to get more Kentucky records digitized. Um, there's some exciting work that's going on right now to do an audit county by county to find out what type of vital records are not already on FamilySearch. And then uh, FamilySearch is gonna be working with our volunteers on the ground and they're gonna be digitizing records in county courthouses all over the Commonwealth. So we're excited about that. Uh, we need you to be an active participant in the community. And uh, we've got a lot of great webinars on the horizon. Um, I just, some of these I've shared previously, uh, one that is pending, but I believe it's gonna be confirmed shortly is September 15th. I just wanna point that one out. That's with uh, Emma Johansson, who is with the Filson Historical Society. Emma has been working on a project um, that she refers to as decolonizing the Bullet family papers. Um, that is uh, the Bullet family, one of uh, Commonwealth's most wealthy families. If you ever driven through Louisville, uh, Oxmoor Farm is uh, one of their holdings. So the Kentucky Genealogical Society uh, 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 invested in a grant to digitize those Bullet family papers. And Emma's been working on bringing to light a lot of the enslaved people who are in them. So uh, that'll be an exciting program again on September 15th. What is not on this schedule is our August uh, seminar series, which will be focused completely on Kentucky. It will be a series of eight webinars. And uh, that information as well as the registration will be um, available at the end of this month. If you're a member, it's $20 for the entire series, which is a real bargain for eight uh, research webinars. If you're not a member, it's $60. So there's a real incentive for folks to become members um, and take advantage of that. Uh, so uh, we love new members. If you are joining us this time, uh, welcome. We'd love to extend an invite for you to become a member. Uh, we are a pretty good fun group and you can learn a lot about researching your Kentucky ancestors. And I want to read uh, this inclusion statement before we get started. This was um, passed by our board a few years ago unanimously. The Kentucky Genealogical Society is committed to creating a diverse and inclusive learning environment for all Kentuckians and Kentucky genealogical researchers. We strive to offer a wide array of topics that support the varied Kentuckian experience and highlight the kaleidoscope of humans of every race, color, religion, national origin, gender identity or expression, sexual orientation, disability, age, veteran status, or immigration path that have called Kentucky home since before its statehood in 1792. We welcome the incredible opportunity to learn and grow together in our pursuit of genealogical education and preservation, uh, which we not only, these are not only words that we um, have approved, but this is how we operate and behave as a society. So you're welcome to participate as a volunteer. We are always uh, welcoming of new volunteers. You can do that at kygs.org slash volunteer, or you can always email me. It might take me a little while to get back in touch with you, but you can send an email to president at kygs.org, and I do respond to emails. All right, uh, Jonathan, I'm gonna introduce him here in just a moment. Uh, before I do, there is on GoToWebinar, you have a little control panel, which has a little orange arrow you should see. Um, you can type in questions that you have for Jonathan throughout his talk. And then at the end, we will take as many questions as we can. And um, just type those in the question section though, and we'll get to those. So um, 
All right, and I'm gonna now introduce our speaker. Uh, one second here. Let's see. Uh, Dr. Jonathan Coleman is co-founder and president of the Faulkner Morgan Archive. He was raised in Eastern Kentucky and he was a James Still Fellow at the University of Kentucky where he received his doctorate in history in 2014. He often lectures on queer history and was a consultant for the Kentucky LGBT Heritage Initiative funded by the National Park Service. Uh, Dr. Coleman's book, Anywhere Together, A Queer History of Kentucky is forthcoming from the University of Press of Kentucky. And um, I will also add that he's a very busy guy because um, uh, we were talking right before we got started that about six months ago, he was named the executive director of the Bluegrass Trust for Historic Preservation. So um, if you are familiar with Kentucky, a lot of you know that that is uh, one of our state's leading preservation organizations. So um, I'm excited to turn it over to him. Dr. Coleman is by far um, the leading historian in the Commonwealth on LGBTQ history. So we got the right guy talking to us tonight. So I'm gonna send you the prompt now, Jonathan, and uh, let's see here. Okay. Well, thank you everyone. I'm going to try my hand at this tech. How are we looking, Christopher? Can you see the screen? Uh, yeah, you can see it, just make the slides. There you go, you're good. Okay, it sounds like there must be a little bit of a, um, a lag. Okay, excellent. Well, to begin with, first of all, thank you. I really do appreciate the chance to come and talk about Kentucky's LGBTQ history with the society. Um, it's an amazing volunteer organization. I love to see nonprofits like that, uh, and especially nonprofits that are dedicated to telling uh, Kentucky's story from the grassroots up uh, and in a really diverse uh, and welcoming way. So thank you all. It is absolutely an honor uh, to get to share you this, to share this rich, varied story, a surprising story, I think, that, <laughs> that few people would expect uh, coming out of the Faulkner Morgan Archive. Uh, now, the Faulkner Morgan Archive itself uh, dates back, oh, a whole seven years, <laughs> eight years, something like that. Um, so we were founded in 2014 and we have simply one mission and that is to save and share Kentucky's LGBTQ history. And what we're finding is just amazing. The history of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer community of Kentucky is long, diverse um, and nationally important. And the goal of the archive is to capture that story uh, in all of its diverse ways and share it with the world. So the archive currently holds over uh, 15,000 individual items, about 200 hours or so of recorded interviews. So it's pretty massive, <laughs> uh, especially for one, it's only been around for about eight years. And we were just one voice telling this story. Um, and we help to amplify other voices, other histories um, as we go along. Uh, so what I'm going to share over the next few minutes, uh, I always like to say it's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, I do plan to save a whole lot of time for questions because I always learn so much. Uh, every time I give these talks, people have stories to share too. People have questions to ask, uh, things that help, you know, sort of get my brain ticking. Uh, and it's one of my favorite parts uh, of doing this kind of work. So we'll be sure to save uh, lots and lots of time for questions at the end. So this I like to call is a, a little bit of a breeze through history. The earliest record that we have in the archive actually dates back um, to European settlement in Kentucky itself, about 1775 or so. Uh, and the two settlers are Robert Craddock and Peter Tardivu. Uh, both had served in the Virginia Continental Army in the Revolutionary War. Uh, and we don't know much about their early lives. We do know that uh, Peter was born in France and immigrated during his lifetime. Uh, Robert Craddock, it seems, was already in Virginia. 
Um, we do know by the 1780s, they're living in central Kentucky. We know they're in Danville. Uh, they're both part of a political club, if you know your early Kentucky history. Uh, and by the early 1800s, both men had made their way to western Kentucky. Uh, and they had started an agricultural operation, you might call it a plantation, uh, called the Hermitage right outside of present-day Bowling Green. Uh, the two men enslaved a large number of black Kentuckians, uh, but unknown anywhere else in Kentucky, Tardivu started a school at the Hermitage, especially for those enslaved children. Uh, we know this because one of those students, Willis Russell, uh, will return to Danville and establish what is arguably the first black school uh, in the state of Kentucky. Um, as the two men had wished upon their deaths, uh, the uh, these enslaved people were emancipated. The land actually split up amongst these black families. Um, and Craddock's fortune, he was the last of the two to die, uh, was left to the city of Bowling Green to fund schools for poor children. And in fact, by the 1920s, that endowment was still funding the public schools of Bowling Green, Kentucky. Uh, and the two men, uh, when they died, uh, were buried side by side. Now, in the 1920s, uh, a Western Kentucky principal published a small article about the two men relating the facts that I just did. But he went further. He explicitly says tradition holds that the men were, and the word he uses, is queer. And it's pretty clear what he means by that. Um, on the tombstones, uh, they do refer to each other as comrades in arms. Uh, and their bodies were eventually moved, actually, to the main cemetery in Bowling Green, Kentucky. And that's where you see uh, the current photograph was taken. Uh, I was told that that cemetery recently published a history and mentioned that these two men might have been lovers, uh, much to some local scorn. Uh, Kentucky is rare to have a story that dates so early. Indeed, there are few like it anywhere in the country. Uh, most of our history is much more difficult to find um, as these people are living in a time when, when they're trying desperately to hide. Uh, sometimes we don't even have the stories themselves. All that we are left with is the material culture, the material evidence of LGBTQ lives. Um, look at these examples from the archive. You know, we have no idea who they belong to, uh, but they were found in Kentucky, in fact, in Georgetown, Kentucky, uh, and they're stereoscopic cards, and they're playing openly with same-sex desire. These two women are getting married, the two women in the series, uh, it ends with them actually having a baby. Uh, the one who is typically dressed in a more masculine style um, asks, "Where well, I wonder where the baby got its blue eyes. Um, for some, this could be, you know, a slightly edgy, humorous parlor joke. But if you're a woman who loves women living in Kentucky around 1900, these cards could be a revelation to you, you know, that other forms of love and family can exist. And you see this a lot in queer networks and intentional ambiguity, creating things that could be enjoyed by a straight audience in one way, uh, but understood totally different by a queer audience. And this gets queer images in front of a wider audience, you know, taking advantage of this ambiguity. This is one of my favorites. Um, so believe it or not, this image appeared in the National Geographic magazine. So if you were a, you know, a boy at the University of Kentucky, you know, thumbing through uh, the National Geographic in 1917, you would have been greeted by this image. Um, and it's a pretty <laughs> telling one. Um, it looks more like the, you know, the opening to a 1970s pornographic film. It's actually an ad for soap, ivory soap. Um, and we know that the illustrator, his name was J.C. Landecker, um, was a gay man. And he's obviously playing with ideas of queer desire. Um, so they're sort of having a laugh at the expense of ivory soap. But they're also opening up possibilities. These two photographs, for example, were both found in Kentucky, collected later by a gay man. Uh, they're anonymous. We have no idea who these people are, but they're pretty enticing. You know, are these women just friendly uh, with each other? You know, is the woman playing dress up or is there something more? Who are these Kentuckians? 
but there are glimpses, right, that start to appear, a separation of the veil. In Muhlenberg County in 1903, for example, we get a glimpse with one small article. You can see the headline here, uh, Mr. Bark was a woman. Um, it turns out that Mr. Bark had been a Miss Green and had been living as a man for 13 years in Muhlenberg County as, as a farmer, and this wasn't discovered until his death. But that's it. That's all we know. Um, but things start to appear, you know, more complete stories uh, begin uh, to make it into the record. And probably um, one of the most famous is Sweet Evening Breeze. Uh, so Sweet Evening Breeze was born in Georgetown, Kentucky, the child of formerly enslaved parents, um, born James Herndon sometime in the late 1800s. Exactly when Sweets was born is a, is a matter of debate, and Sweets certainly didn't make it easy on researchers uh, trying to figure out exactly how old she was. Uh, now, she claimed to have been abandoned at Good Samaritan Hospital, which is in Lexington, as a child. And there is absolutely no evidence that this ever happened. Uh, but Sweets did grow up to be head orderly there. Uh, he was notoriously effeminate, uh, often feminized his clothing, and sometimes would simply walk the streets in full-on drag. Now, you would think a gender-bending Black queer man would not last long in a segregated city like Lexington in the mid-20th century. But Sweets was surprisingly adored. Uh, he was well-connected uh, and often protected by Lexingtonians. And there are lots of memories out there about Sweets. Uh, how during World War II, he would bring uh, baked goods down to the train station to give out to soldiers. Um, how he'd walk the streets in a wedding dress on Halloween. Uh, and he was particularly known for his closeness to the University of Kentucky football team. Uh, in fact, the photograph you see in the center um, is sweet sitting with a UK football player uh, around 1954. And interestingly enough, it was the football player who saved that photograph, not Sweets. Uh, what wasn't known until fairly recently is how long Sweets was actually doing this kind of work, um, queering Lexington, you know, much longer than ever expected. Um, so you, Sweets was holding womanless weddings at local black churches, events they advertised in the local papers. Uh, you can see Sweets dressed up as a bride from the 1930s. Um, and while Sweets is the best known of Lexington's early cross-dressing black men, drag queens, if you want to call them that, uh, Sweets was certainly not uh, the only one. A large culture of black drag flourished in central Kentucky. Uh, and it's around this period, uh, the 1950s, um, that Sweets takes pity on a young boy from Eastern Kentucky named Henry Faulkner. Henry Faulkner would become a famous artist, is arguably one of the most famous artists from Kentucky, uh, but he's also an icon of Kentucky's gay community. And this might be my favorite single image in the archive. I mean, have you ever seen uh, a better example of pure joy than what's on Henry's face there? Uh, raised in Eastern Kentucky, uh, Clay County, uh, Faulkner would travel the world, making connections with many prominent folks. In fact, one of his closest friends uh, was the famous playwright Tennessee Williams. Uh, the archive is particularly rich in uh, material from Henry. That's how we got our name, the Faulkner Morgan. Uh, and he has to be one of the best documented gay men of the 20th century. Uh, he was unabashedly open about his sexuality. And I've given talks just uh, on Henry alone. There's so much material. Uh, but few people could be as open as Henry was in the mid 20th century for good reason. You know, it wasn't all fun and games and taking your pictures with sailors. Uh, Central Kentucky was a dangerous place to be for queer people. Um, police harassment, social ostracism, um, a very real chance of violence. Uh, Henry Faulkner is a perfect example uh, in many ways of what awaited those in Kentucky who were known to be gay. 
this is um, this is Henry's mugshot taken in 1951. So this would have been right before um, Henry uh, went to live with Sweet Evening Breeze. And so this was taken in Washington, D.C., where he was imprisoned in a psychiatric hospital against his will for a year. Uh, he was imprisoned in psych wards at least twice in his life. In fact, the first time was in Louisville. Uh, and he was arrested at least five times. Uh, the second image is an article from Lexington detailing how local police officers undercover raided Henry's house. Despite all this harassment, some Lexingtonians fared. Um, much worse than Henry. In 1960, black drag culture was attacked. Uh, shows that had just 25 years before uh, been celebrated in Woodland Park Auditorium were now raided by the Lexington police at the Lyric Theater. The names of the and faces of the Queens published in the Herald the Lexington Herald and the Lexington Leader. And there you can see two of the Queens actually on stage at the Lyric Theater as part of this undercover operation uh, being done by the Lexington police. The raid on the Lyric drag show um, was during the same time as a reported crackdown on perverts, as they called it, in August of 1961. Uh, this led to a staged entrapment in the men's restroom of the Greyhound bus station on East Short Street in Lexington. Uh, ten men were arrested that night, including a music teacher at Shackleton's Music Store on West Main Street. Uh, his name was Vernon Ishmael. Uh, Vernon died by suicide the next day. But despite this growing persecution, there was right alongside it a growing vibrant scene of LGBTQ folks coming together, although discreetly, uh, especially in local bars. Uh, you see this quite a bit in Louisville, um, but of course our focus is mostly Lexington here um, at the Faulkner Morgan. The bar in the image is the Mayfair Bar, located at 224 East Main Street, opened around 1939. Uh, in our interviews, uh, this is the bar that keeps popping up over and over in some of the earliest ones, is a bar that allowed, quote, unquote, all sorts and, quote, unquote, certain types. Uh, there was also the Zebra Lounge, which was a couple of blocks away, uh, that opened in 1948. Uh, the Mayfair Bar was replaced in 1953 by the Southern Cocktail Lounge, which was remembered as cruisy uh, and gay friendly. In 1963, that same space uh, became the Gilded Cage. Uh, and this was a bar restaurant operated by a gay couple from Chicago uh, named John Hill and Estel Wilson. Uh, it was among the earliest, if not the earliest, exclusively gay bar in Kentucky. Uh, one police officer I interviewed remembered an incident when, uh, upon walking inside the gilded cage, he found men dancing with men and women women dancing with women, uh, and the officer asked the male couple, uh, who's the man and who's the woman? And one of the men replied, this week, I'm the woman. Uh, very, uh, very funny stories from, these, um, from this police officer. Uh, in 1967, that space, uh, moves from becoming the gilded cage to becoming the living room. Uh, and it is already uh, advertising itself as the gayest spot in town. You can actually see their little matchbook cover there uh, that we have in the archive. Um, and it's while it's the living room in the uh, mid to late 60s uh, that drag shows start appearing in that space, uh, revitalizing Lexington's long history of drag. Um, and you start to see these sort of um, professionalized drag queens. There you can actually see Sweet Evening Breeze right in the center uh, coming down the famous spiral staircase of the living room bar. One of her daughters was Lee Angelique. And this album actually came to us from Portland, Oregon. 
um, showing these fascinating images of Lee, uh, who would enjoy a long career in Lexington. In fact, these were taken in Newport, Kentucky, uh, at a bar called Club Riviera. And they were taken by a, a graduate student in sociology who followed Lee around um, for a semester uh, and had these amazing images um, in her possession that she sent to the archive. So the experience of LGBTQ folks in Lexington is one of contradictions, harassment and tolerance, community and anonymity, the things were about to change. The modern gay liberation movement was sweeping into Lexington, uh, and many in the queer community here would not only welcome that change, but fan the flames of liberation. The radical fight for gay rights uh, is perhaps best epitomized by a struggle that happened at the University of Kentucky. Students there started what is arguably the first openly gay organization uh, to formally form in the state, uh, and that was the Gay Liberation Front. There was a chapter of this in Louisville, um, but the one at UK actually tries to organize itself in some sort of um, formal capacity. Uh, the Gay Liberation Front actually began as an after hours class at the university in 1970. And so it was a mix of students, non-students, lesbians, and gays, uh, and it was typically small, about eight people or so, but they had some pretty grand ideas, and their mission was to be a social space for queer folks beyond the local bar scene. Uh, in November of 1971, they applied for formal recognition as a student organization with the University of Kentucky. Uh, the university refused to acknowledge them. Uh, in fact, they even threatened to disband all student groups before they would recognize a gay one. Uh, but the Gay Liberation Front, it was uh, fueled by the anti-war movement. In fact, they were, um, in all eight regular members were also very involved in anti-war activity. Um, they began legal proceedings. Again, they were suing the university. Uh, and the case would take uh, several years to actually work its way through the courts. And their president at the time was a sophomore. His name was Peter Taylor. He was from Whitley County. He's now on the board of the Falker Morgan Archive. Uh, and he agreed to be named as the plaintiff in the case, um, effectively outing him uh, to the entire state of Kentucky. Uh, the Gay Liberation Front loses its case. Um, it was argued that they were encouraging students to break the law. Uh, and technically they were. Uh, state Attorney General at the time, his name was Ed Hancock, uh, he described the group as a lawful group sprinkled with unlawful activity, which I think is really fun. Uh, and it would take several more attempts um, and another decade before UK uh, would recognize a gay student group. Uh, the students, um, many involved with the GLF, do get the first gay event. Uh, openly gay event in Kentucky, and that was the Gay Rights Cha-Cha, or the Gay Rights Dance. Lesbian women, well-trained uh, from their involvement in the anti-war uh, and feminist movements are especially adept um, at keeping the momentum going. Uh, radical feminist communes, at least three, flourish uh, in central Kentucky. Um, everything from discussion groups to gardening clubs for lesbians are formed. Uh, newsletters are printed, uh, like Women Energy, uh, and one of the most long-lived and celebrated of these efforts uh, is the all-female music group uh, known as the Amber Moon. Um, you also get some uh, sort of openly lesbian bars. In fact, the Faulkner Morgan Archive just uh, ended uh, a pretty lengthy study of one called The Country, which was located here in Lexington, uh, and is arguably the first lesbian bar in Kentucky. Uh, it's not exactly sure there was a coffee shop in Louisville that might have beat it. Um, so women creating their own sorts of spaces. And it's women, lesbian women, who are, not surprisingly, um, in many ways, the focus of retaliation of this liberation movement 
Uh, so Kentucky actually makes lesbian sex explicitly illegal uh, in 1974. And probably the most iconic example of this repression comes in the 1970s, uh, when the local lesbian community is attacked uh, by the FBI after the arrival of a lesbian couple named Catherine Ann Power and Susan Sachs. So these two women uh, had been students at Brandeis University. They had helped rob, rob a bank in Boston uh, to fund their anti-war movement activity um, in, the in 1970, I believe. Um, and an officer was shot and killed by one of their accomplices. Uh, by 1974, the lesbian couple had made their way to Lexington to hide, uh, of course, under aliases. Uh, Susan Sachs was a cook at a famous um, sort of queer hangout spot called Alfalfa's. Um, they left after a year. Uh, they had gotten rumors that the FBI had actually found them. Uh, Sachs was arrested a few months later, but Powers got away and actually was in hiding uh, until uh, 1993. Now, their arrival has far-reaching consequences for Lexington. Uh, the FBI do indeed find out the couple had been here in Lexington, and they start putting pressure on the lesbian community. Um, and eventually, five lesbian women and one gay man will go to prison for refusing to cooperate with the investigation by the FBI. Uh, one lesbian woman, she was uh, just out of the UK, a very young woman named Jill Raymond, she'll be imprisoned for over a year for refusing uh, to testify to a grand jury. Uh, the FBI uses blackmail. Uh, they threaten to out the women to their families and employers for refusing to talk. Um, agents will go to gay spaces in Lexington, like a bar called the Bungalow, um, and start secretly photographing the patrons uh, in order to have proof of their homosexuality. Uh, a woman's law group produced and distributed the pamphlet that you see there on the screen uh, to Lexington's lesbian community so they know their rights if the FBI came knocking on their door. And that was a real possibility. Um, things weren't safe in Lexington, especially for the lesbian community. Uh, despite this harassment, though, the genie is um, sort of already out of the bottle. Uh, the 1970s not only sees an explosion of uh, groups and political action, but also an explosion of social spaces, bars in particular. Uh, the living room eventually morphs into Johnny Angels, which is a two-story uh, spread out across a couple of buildings in downtown Lexington, a New York-style disco. Uh, it is still there today. It's now called the Bar Complex, um, and it is absolutely wild. <laughs> it attracts some of Disco's uh, best talent. Um, Sylvester performs there. Um, probably the most notable performer uh, during the early days of Johnny Angels uh, is Grace Jones, uh, and you can see some of the photographs of her performance uh, upstairs in the Disco, uh, taken by Melissa Watt, uh, a lesbian photographer in Lexington at the time. This space within Lexington uh, is in many ways, it's almost sacred. Uh, it's a very important space uh, for queer folks. Uh, the back parking lot is especially popular with those uh, who couldn't get into the bar. They were too young or they couldn't afford to enter. Uh, and that back parking lot facing Water Street will get notoriously cruisy. Um, and a few doors down the center of Lexington's gay prostitution circuit is established known as the wall. Uh, inside, Johnny Angels had this sort of glamorous air, uh, and no one was perhaps more glamorous uh, than Crystal Blue, uh, a famous Lexington drag queen uh, and a trans woman. And here she is uh, on New Year's Eve around 1980, uh, showcasing that glamour and beauty she was known for. In fact, we actually just lost Crystal. Um, she died, um, I would say advanced in age, but of course no one knows how old Crystal Blue is, um, but she lived a long, very happy life uh, and passed away just a few months ago. Um, but Johnny Angels is certainly not the only place in town 
uh, a sweet evening breeze once said, they were everywhere hatching like chickens out of eggs. Uh, so you have spaces like the bungalow, uh, crossings, the country door, the hidden door, um, and probably two of the most famous uh, were owned by the same drag queen named Bradley Picklesheimer, uh, Club A Go Go and Cafe Elemental P. Um, and Bradley's bars were more punk bars, uh, mixing drag, punk, um, bringing out some really famous people, probably uh, the most famous person to perform there, the very famous drag queen, uh, Divine. And it seemed like, you know, the sky really was the limit there for a little bit. But as the 1980s progressed, you know, a dark cloud was on the horizon. Um, there is a postcard in the archive from Frank Close, sent in 1983, um, a Kentucky artist, and all it says is, should we start to care about AIDS? Um, and the postcard is almost prophetic. Um, because there you can see the image. It's of the crypt of Capuchin monks in Rome, and it's almost like a portent. In fact, in 1983, AIDS finally got a name, um, and the bodies did indeed pile up. Uh, queer people uh, across Kentucky would be lost. The exact numbers are still not known, but it's certainly in the thousands. And although the story of the epidemic is usually told through urban centers like New York and San Francisco, it was just as prevalent and devastating here, uh, perhaps even more so. Uh, the archive has been particularly keen to record the stories um, of this generation, so many of whom were lost. The Lexington LGBTQ community mourned their dead. They fought the disease as best they could. Um, and it's in the killing fields of AIDS that LGBTQ activism becomes extraordinarily politicized. Um, widespread grassroots uh, and Lexington was fairly responsive. By 1987, uh, you have groups like the AIDS Volunteers of Lexington, which are still around. Um, the city's health department appointed an AIDS coordinator. Uh, but it's also a very difficult place to be in Kentucky during the AIDS crisis. Um, local police across the state began enforcing sodomy laws in a more draconian way. Uh, it was still illegal to be gay in Kentucky. Um, and they used these laws as a direct response uh, to the fear of AIDS. Uh, in 1986, in Lexington, an entrapment sting is in the back lot of the bar, uh, Johnny Angels. Uh, and numerous men are arrested, including a young Eastern Kentucky man named Jeffrey Wasson. Uh, Wasson refused to go along quietly and he challenged the arrest. Uh, and although his case lasted seven years and was defended by local Kentucky lawyers, uh, Wasson's defense led to an overturn of the Kentucky sodomy laws. Uh, and in fact, Kentucky would be the first state after the advent of AIDS to decriminalize um, homosexual behavior. Uh, if there is uh, a silver lining to the AIDS epidemic, it is this mobilization that happens in the LGBTQ community. Um, fighting for your literal lives does that to a group of people. Uh, conversations in large, uh, including the one for gay marriage, but also for just basic protections under the law, such as not being fired uh, or thrown out of housing because of one's sexual orientation or gender expression. Uh, Louisville will be the first city in Kentucky to protect its gay and lesbian cities, uh, citizens, although uh, the ordinance does not protect uh, gender expression for trans Kentuckians. Um, this all happens in 1999. Um, a few months later, uh, Lexington will also pass a fairness ordinance. And so far, I think there's about 15 or so fairness ordinances in the state. Um, but even if the entire state of Kentucky had equal protections for queer folks, it is uh, probably still not enough. In 2013, Kentucky passed uh, the Religious Freedom Act, basically exempting anyone from following a fairness ordinance if they felt it was against their religious beliefs. Uh, Governor Bashir, the father, um, at the time did veto this bill, 
um, but the state legislature overrode his veto in both the House and the Senate. Uh, and this actually uh, was passed, the Religious Freedom Act, as a response to an event that had happened in Kentucky uh, with a print shop called Hands On Originals, uh, who refused, um, after they made a bid, uh, they refused to print t-shirts for a local gay pride uh, because it conflicted with the so-called Christian nature of their business. Uh, and it's still not exactly, it did make it to Kentucky Supreme Court, but the the actual status of um, fairness ordinances are still in question uh, in the state of Kentucky. And so as the hands-on original case shows, this is a history that's still being written. Um, the archive recognizes this. Um, you know, some of the factors that make it hard to find our history, like repression, homophobia, apathy, uh, still affects what stories from today make it into the future. So we do collect material from events uh, and lives as they happen, uh, like the image that you currently see uh, from an artist, a queer artist named Cassie Lewis, who chronicles the trans community of Louisville, um, as she does in this great piece, Ian Smoking. Um, or these Polaroids um, taken um, in 2013 uh, by an artist named James Lyon, who um, goes today by the name of White Fox. Or photographs sort of taken in time almost second by second uh, by an artist, a Lexington-based artist named Louis Beckett, uh, who's deposited digital copies of his extensive photographic record of Lexington's Gay Pride Festivals. Um, some of the images are just really beautiful, um, colorful things. Um, he deposited these images, um, I believe in 2017 or so. Um, and sadly, we have lost Louis since then. He died a few years ago. Um, so what I've shared today is just a sampling uh, of the stories, the tragedies, the triumphs, the lives uh, that the Faulkner Morgan Archive uh, gets to represent in their stories like yours. And we're always collecting. Uh, so if you have a dusty box of photographs, an old t-shirt, you know, something that helps shed light on the history of LGBTQ Kentucky, um, I'm interested. Um, it's important. Um, so I'm more than happy to take questions. Uh, thank you all. Um, I'm excited for the conversation. I will stop sharing my screen. Great, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Coleman. And uh, we, if anyone has any questions for Jonathan, just type them into the question section on GoToWebinar and we'll get to as many as we can. And while we're waiting for questions to come in, um, your talk, it, it actually, you a couple of the images you showed, they triggered memories for me. So one was, uh, I went to the University of Kentucky and I was an editor of the Kentucky Colonel. So when I saw the the picture of the newspaper, I was like, I'm very familiar with that. And then the, um, the uh, you had a picture of the, um, the block of buildings in Lexington. One was the, it used to be, I think the Phoenix Hotel, which was back in the, Early 90s when I was there, it was an apartment complex where I used to live. So uh, fascinating to see see that image and kind of be triggered. But uh, what, what, what I'll tell you what is interesting is hearing you share this history. You know, I grew up in Kentucky. I don't ever remember. I remember Kentucky history in elementary school. I remember American history in high school. I remember taking history courses. I don't ever remember, you know, anyone ever talking about LGBTQ history in any of those. So, and I'm in my 40s, so I just imagine people in their 50s, 60s, like they have absolutely no, they have not went through any sort of, you know, your your information that you've shared this evening is probably like some of the the first information that they will learn about, you know, in terms of LGBT. Um, in Kentucky, which is kind of crazy when you think of it, you know, just that it hasn't been there. There just hasn't been anything out there. Right. And so, or if, or if there has been, it's been really tough to find. 
Um, and it is a new, it, it's a new field. Like people haven't thought about the history of sexuality. Uh, people haven't thought about the history of gender, um, you know, for in a rigorous, you know, studious way for a long, long time. Uh, but communities carry stories. Um, and this is especially true for marginalized, um, historically oppressed communities, right? They have ways in which they get their, <laughs> you know, their past may not be recognized by um, formalized institutions. You know, it may not show up in textbooks. It may not be collected by, um, you know, university archives or libraries or that sort of thing. Um, and so it becomes uh, difficult to find sometimes. Uh, but th at the same time, these communities do amazing jobs at making sure their stories survive. Um, the, and so now, you know, we're at a place to where we can perhaps uh, be more thoughtful, be more focused on making sure that those stories um, get out um, to larger communities. You know, I came across it, you know, when I moved to Lexington myself. Um, I found, um, you know, a lot of community um, storytelling, um, and it, especially at the bars. And so people had, you know, lots of stories to tell about the bar complex and rumors and um, all of these innuendos of, you know, what all went there and the spiral staircase that used to be there. Uh, stories of Sweet Evening Breeze and Henry Faulkner. And that's sort of how I got into it. You know, I was interested in this space. Um, and there were other community folks who had done some work. Um, there was a grad student at UK um, who'd written a dissertation. He was a geography student, but was interested in sexuality and gender and had written what I would argue was a history. I don't think he would as a geographer, uh, but basically a, um, a recollection of a queer Kentucky past, and that helped lead me to some original sources. And um, so it's, um, you know, it's a really um, intriguing story, but it's also an honor to get to, you know, be someone who helps share it. So this question, uh, you and I talked about, may come up and it did, which is how did you set up the archive? <laughs> so the archive, I always like to say the archive was an accident, um, and it kind of was. Uh, so back in uh, 2013, there were a couple of things that happened. Uh, one, uh, there was an exhibit at Transylvania University put on by an artist called I'll Be Your Mirror uh, by Bob Morgan, who was pretty much the protege of Henry Faulkner. He lived with Henry, he was really close with Henry. Um, had been out in Lexington, um, out in Kentucky since the 1960s. And so he was interested in um, the uh, uh, sort of the queer artistic past. And so he had put on an exhibit at Transy. Uh, also in conjunction with a film from a a Kentucky born, but she eventually uh, made it to Seattle, a filmmaker named Jean Donahue called The Last Gospel of the Pagan Babies, where she's chronicling these folks that she knew herself in the 70s and uh, the 80s, and especially a series of photographs that had sort of disappeared. Um, so some wonderful tidbits of queer history, but what's going to happen next? Um, Bob was being courted by uh, a university collection that he was, he was worried about what a state funded institution would do with his stuff. You know, uh, what happens if the culture changes? You know, what happens if, and you know, he loved the people he was working with at that institution, but there was always the sense of, you know, what happens if someone threatens to cut your funding because you have this stuff. Um, which in 2014 seemed a little far-fetched, but it seems a little less far-fetched today. Um, and so he said he thought the best thing to do would be to just make sure another queer person had it and kind of kick the can down the road and maybe in 30 years, things would be safe enough. And so he asked me if I'd keep it. And I said, sure, I would, I would be honored to do that. Uh, but you just can't bring it to my house in boxes. I, I need to know what this stuff is. 
And so we started uh, going over cataloging his collection. My little, in fact, the webcam I'm using right now is what we started with. Um, the uh, recording the things he had to say about the stuff. And this became our process. So I would bring that material home, I would archive it, you know, put it in archival boxing, create a collection guide for each visit we had. Um, and then it just started to pile up. And it became a conversation of, well, there's Peter Taylor, who's from the Gay Liberation Front. Peter's getting old, Peter's got stuff. It's gotta go somewhere, someone's gotta. And so we started to go do oral histories with Peter and then it just grew and grew. And so in uh, 2017, we incorporated as a 501c3, an actual nonprofit. Um, and so we now have uh, a really fantastic board uh, of about eight people who manage the archive uh, and who help us um, from across the state. And it has grown you know, pretty tremendously. Uh, we do now have funds for um, a little bit of staff and, um, and a pretty robust paid internship program uh, that helps too. So we're very proud of uh, the support the archive has gotten. What I think is so fascinating is you're um, kind of creating this archive from scratch. And when we think a lot about the different archives we access as researchers, you know, some of them have been around for a long, long time. And so as researchers, you know, we're sort of, we um, are probably, this is sort of a new thing is um, just thinking differently about like a new archive that's emerging um, and uh, all the things that you're working through with like a, a board and, and setting it up and right. I'm sure doing fundraising and all of that sort of thing just to get it, get it going. Man. So, you know, I, I'm an academic historian. That's how I'm trained. I'm not an archivist. And so my, I have, a lot of experience with archives, but it's as a user of archives, not as you know a creator of one. And in, and I'm actually pretty proud of the methodology that we created for the archive because so when you have a historically oppressed group, right, a, a group whose history supposedly didn't exist or right wasn't worthy of recording, or that these stories get dismissed as gossip or you know that sort of thing. So when you have a historically marginalized community and you are asking them to share and record their stories, it becomes imperative, right, that they get to record and share that story in a narrative um, in, a, in a way that makes sense to them. And so what we did at the archive, and, and it's a hard way to do it, but it's worth it, I would argue, is so when we take in a collection, those collections are done with oral histories at the same time. So the individual is actually recorded, we typically video record it. Uh, and they're talking about the stuff they're giving. So, you know, they may pull out a photograph and they will describe who is in that photograph. Um, and then the way that we organize that collection, it is actually organized by the way in which they give it um, so that and then those objects that they talk about get time stamped. So when they get accessioned into the collection, you know, they will get a little time stamp. So if you want to hear, um, you know, this individual talk about this photograph, you can go to their oral history at this time, right, and actually see what they say about it and the way that they respond to it. And so their the donor's collection is, um, you know, reflects the narrative that the donor themselves gives, um, which is, um, to us, it does a couple of things. One, um, it preserves their own sort of sense of history, while it also um, sort of honors the way that they create their own narrative. Um, so we try to put as much of that power back into the hands uh, of the person uh, who's actually donating the material. So uh, two questions about the donations. One is um, what specific types of material is the archive collecting in terms of uh, items? And then the second question is if someone wanted to, so you've got the folks who are participating this evening, but this is being recorded and it'll be accessible to our membership all over all over the place. So if someone has something they want to donate, we don't want to overwhelm you, but 
what would they do to to uh, to go about seeing if it's something you're interested in? Right. So we do have a really specific collecting policy at the Faulkner Morgan Archive. Uh, so we only collect material uh, directly related to LGBTQ Kentucky. So it has to be material coming from a queer Kentuckian um, about queer Kentucky or directly related. Um, and it pretty much has to be uh, individual, unique, not mass printed. So for example, uh, you know, if someone wanted to give us their collection of the advocate from the 1970s, we would say no. <laughs> you know, sorry, we don't have the room for it. Um, now we do have mass printed material, but it's things like uh, Gay, which was a magazine that was started uh, in 1969 in New York. It's one of the first weekly, uh, probably is the first weekly uh, gay magazine in the world, but it was started by a man from. Um, Hyman, Kentucky. Uh, and so therefore we have, and he talks a lot about being from Kentucky throughout uh, the run of that publication. So stuff like that. So we collect uh, printed material uh, manuscripts. We do collect some 3D material. Um, we are especially rich when it comes to visual images. Uh, and a lot of that is simply because of our earliest days being so associated with artists. Um, so that we have a lot of um, visual material in the archive. Um, so we have some clothing, we have, <laughs> uh, it really runs the gamut. And so if you have material out there, the best way uh, really to reach us is our website, faulknermorgan.org. Um, and if you go there to the About Us, you will see uh, information about how people access our collections, how they can use our collections, uh, and also how they can contribute to those collections. Wonderful. So uh, just a couple questions came in. There were more research methodology questions. And so for folks who are maybe just getting started researching your LGBTQ ancestors, just as a some context for Jonathan's talk, um, in our archive uh, on kygs.org, you can uh, go on and on demand view a webinar from a couple of years ago with Dr. Stuart Trayman, who focuses on LGBTQ research methodology. So um, for those of you who are like trying to figure out as you're researching your ancestors, maybe you had an LGBTQ ancestor, what kind of things to look for, that might be a webinar you wanna um, to view. Um, and I'll just take, uh, I have more of a question myself. So I had um, my father, he had about 98 first cousins, I'm not kidding, big family. And I have found four of them that were in his generation that passed away due to AIDS. Um, and one of them was an artist. And so he, you know, uh, was published in newspapers and you could go and see his art like locally and so he was sort of well known but the sense that I get is that you know even just in my dad's generation a lot of this history is being sort of just lost because you know these folks maybe were marginalized or they were the family was ashamed of them or they didn't talk about them so I, I mean it's, it's almost like this material it's 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 rare to find it you know uh, when you do um, I'm sure this is something you probably were running into, but. Yeah, definitely. And, and it's endangered. Um, you know, it's, as you all know, <laughs> yeah, I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, history records, especially can be extraordinarily ephemeral. You know, they can disappear so easily. And especially when it comes to things like um, uh, individuals who are talking about their, their health and especially a disease that came with so many uh, social, moral, religious, you know, things attached to it. You know, those stories disappear. Like, interesting, I was actually having a um, lunch with an older woman and she was talking about her cousin um, who, had, who had obviously died of AIDS and no one in that family would ever say it, like would never talk about it. Um, even, you know, even though he has been gone, you know, 30 some years, uh, but, um, you know, it's, it's not something that's over. 
um, it's still something that's really prevalent um, and that we have to you know part of the mission of the archive is you know that we fight back against that a little bit that we resist that tendency to not want to share those stories because they are important yeah i'll just share um so my the, the cousin that i'm thinking of his name was uh john pascal brown and he died in 1994 and so he would go around louisville and uh use stencils to spray paint trust jesus all yeah. over uh <laughs> you know these public spaces and mm -hmm. Um, a lot of his material was collected, but I was doing research on him and um, on Find a Grave, and someone posted photos of him that was not a family member, and so I reached out to them, and come lo and behold, it was a friend of his, and so they were able to share some, you know, some stories about him that I would have not known anything about. But um, you, you know, the, the information is out there. You have to kind of just kind of piece things together, though. I guess maybe. <laughs> the historian's work i guess yeah okay well um one other question that came through and then we'll let you go um the question was around uh, are any of the archives digitized and then the um the follow-up to that is did you know that we have a digitization grant fund so we are we are always doing digitization projects in case that's of interest to the archive that is very good to know so right now we don't have massive parts of the archive digitized at all um, and in some ways it's uh, it's simply just not a focus of the archive right now you know we're a really small organization uh, you know we're collecting uh, we understand uh, of course that is something that we would like to do right we would eventually like to get um, a lot of this stuff as accessible as possible but unfortunately it's just not something we do now um, we do um, you know, when we have researchers who can't physically get here uh, for whatever reason, uh, we do offer some pretty in-depth research assistance um, ourselves, you know, we help to digitize uh, things. Um, but in terms of sort of a standard digitization of the archive, we don't. But it's nice to know where that there's some money. <laughs> And, and just uh, uh, one other question, a real quick one, is you're, you're collecting for, throughout Kentucky, correct? Or just right. central Kentucky. Okay. So our um, our current archive does really heavily focus on central Kentucky, but that is not the aim. In fact, at our recent uh, our most recent strategic plan, um, you know, that's one of our goals is to really start to expand beyond. So we're especially rich in central Kentucky. That's of course where we got started in eastern Kentucky. Uh, we're less so. Louisville is lucky. Um, you know, you've had David Williams and. Um, the Williams Nichols archive at work for quite a while uh, and so there's a big body of information at Louisville um, they have donated their collection the Williams and Nichols archive um, and so the but there are yeah broad swaths of the states we would eventually like we have a goal to where we can have um, at least one thing one record one photograph you know, one story that we can tie to every state, I mean, every county in the state. Uh, that's our goal. Wonderful. And so you mentioned the Williams Archive, and is that at, just because there's going to be people on here who have never heard of that, is that at the University of Louisville? Is that correct? It is. Is that the, oh. um, is that the Ekstrom, Ekstrom Library? So it's okay. the Special Collections Library at the University of Louisville. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because uh, you know we've got people from all over, and they're like, "Where is everything at?" You know, it's yeah. a, uh, so there's the Baltimore <laughs> Morgan Archive. There's and and there's probably like little bits and pieces here and there everywhere. You know, just scattered wow. about. But, yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate yeah. you spending time with us, taking lots of questions. Um, we have a little bit of housekeeping, but I'm going to let you go. Thank you, and we will um, before we wrap up here. Let me just take control back um but thank you again and we may have you come back uh we have a member who focuses on the uh researching using the uh the national trust for historic preservation database of how necessary yeah of course yeah because uh -huh. there's a ton of genealogical information in there so maybe we will maybe you'll hear from us again on um on what you're doing in that space too. So, but thank you so much and you, um, you take care and 
uh, hopefully we've gotten a lot of good information out there for folks this evening. So thank you. Thank you all. Bye now. All right. So we have just a little bit of housekeeping. I'm going to um, pull this up here and let's see here. Okay. Um, let's see. We've got some kind of promos for what's what's coming in the future. Um, let me share this screen. Okay. Uh, on June 2nd, we have Pamela Guy Holland, who's going to be coming to talk to us about DNA painter and chromosome mapping. Um, this is free to members. It's $15 for everyone else. So Pamela will have a really great talk. Um, she's talked to us before. Uh, and this is really great information if you are um, getting involved with the DNA research and you're trying to figure out how to organize all your matches. You've got 70,000 matches. You know, how do you make sense of all that? Um, then we've got Marion Pierre-Louis on June 14th. She's going to be talking to us about five steps to becoming a good ancestor. Again, this is free to members, $15 for everyone else. Um, Cynthia Meharry's uh, talk, Getting a Good Start, Things I Wish I'd Known About Genealogical Research Before I Began. That is now on the website in the archive, so you can watch that on demand. There's now over 60 webinars that you can view on demand on the Kentucky Genealogical Society website archive. So if you are a new member, you definitely want to take advantage of those resources. If you haven't joined us, hopefully through this evening and through uh, what I'm sharing with you, you can see the value of being a member. We offer a lot of webinars. Our membership starts at $20 a year. You get access to all these on-demand video programs, as well as some other goodies on our website. So thank everybody for participating this evening. Uh, again, if you're not a member, we welcome you to join us at kygs.org. And I hope everybody has a good evening. Thank you and take care. Bye-bye.